Hi everyone, welcome to another really exciting episode of Voice of Crypto where we get distinguished guests from the Web3 crypto and blockchain space. And today we have with us two really special guests from a testant, uh, Dr. Steve and Dr. Noman. Really happy to have you both on our show today. How are you doing, guys? Uh, great, and, and thank you for, for inviting us on the show. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about Attestant and your role at the firm, both of you, um, I think, Steve? Okay, I'll, I'll start the ball rolling. My, my name's Steve Berryman. I, I'm the Chief Business Officer. Um, a bit about my history. I'm, uh, like many people in Attestant, we, my background is in banking. Uh, I worked for many years in the capital markets. Um, spent a long time there on the infrastructure and technology side and uh, looking at things for uh, efficiencies onto the front office, uh, front desk and, uh, and um, uh, new products. And that whole area back in the early 2000s was an exciting time. Um, but things changed in 2007, 2008. And, um, you know, I, I started to think of... of doing different things and crypto sort of come around about 2015 for myself, um, discovered it and went down the rabbit hole and, and didn't come back out again, really. So uh, that was a that was my once I entered into it, we, we uh, Ethereum was um, probably the biggest part of that. Uh, I, I met a bunch of people in Ethereum London who had the same type of background and we spent quite a few years discussing different projects and different things that we uh, thought we'd be interested in. And 2019, proof of stake uh, was being talked about in Ethereum. And 2019, there was a bunch of us that decided to uh, get together and thought this was the type of service that um, institutions could be interested in. And being our background, being in banking, we thought it was uh, uh, an area to, to start uh, you know, a potential business which we did, um, and we first invested in the tools, uh, uh, tested mm -hmm. invested in a number of tools for um, uh, for developing the, the staking. And then 2020, we, we launched the staking product as uh, as an institutional, for institutional clients when Ethereum went live. So that's a quick quick summary of, uh, uh, of, of my history. Yeah. Back to my background, uh, my name's Neiman Ahmed. I'm the CRO of Attestant. Uh, I also have a financial services background. So I worked at HSBC for 10 years in their risk management department, uh, mm. covering both the asset management and the private banking businesses, which had a combined AUM of 200 billion. Um, from there, I went on to, to work as a, as a chief risk and compliance officer uh, at a hedge fund in Knightsbridge. Um, and the nature of that role meant that I was uh, an approved person on the FCA register. And from there, really, um, I had the opportunity to join a testant and the next evolution of finance, uh, uh, potentially. So that's my sort of, you know, quick journey into, into crypto. So, so how does a testant sort of uh, brand itself as the next generation or next or the future of finance? And uh, if you could talk a little bit briefly about the services, products that a testant offers and how has it evolved as a company over the last few years? Uh, I mean, I can talk about the, the product. I mean, we, we started, uh, we knew Ethereum was moving to proof of stake. So we decided to concentrate just on that. And the reason being is that we believe that Ethereum uh, was gonna be the future of the rails of finance. And we also, you know, like the US Treasury is the, is, is the risk-free rate of the uh, finance world, which everyone, uh, everything else is built on top of. We saw the same with staking. Uh, mm. Staking was the, the raw yield from Ethereum. And we, we saw that very similar um, uh, very similar journey to, to the to, mm -hmm. as, as Ethereum gets built out, and we saw the opportunity to really, if you, we were, if we could get at that rate and offer the services, then we we could, you know, there was an opportunity then to build other things on top. But we just saw that that has been very important, and we purely focused on that. So our product is very simple in a non-custodial uh, company. We we um, 
uh, and we offer staking, uh, the, basically access to the raw staking that come around in 2020. Got it. So how is the staking market looking like right now? And also compare how it was during a bull market versus now. Um, I mean, it, it's, the strange thing is the staking is not, the market itself is not um, directly influenced by the price. Okay, we, we didn't see uh, people coming in as price was higher or lower. I mean, most people come into staking. Like, like people buy treasuries, you sort of see that people just who have got Ethereum want to get yield and are long-term holders. So the up and down doesn't really affect the flow or, um, in, into Ethereum staking. And of course, up until recently, you couldn't withdraw, withdraw your money anyway. So um, I, I think what we saw at the beginning, we, we saw two types of clients. I think in 2020, when it first kicked off in December 2020, we got a lot of clients that were, you know, probably in at the beginning, were in the Genesis block of Ethereum, so back in 2015, and they wanted to be in the Genesis block of the next version of Ethereum. So they were keen to be there at the beginning, and we set ourselves up to be to be able to deal with uh, scale and institution-type clients, uh, uh, things like KYC. We would, we, 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 were, we did these type of things. So there was, a, there was a certain type of client that, you know, the, the family offices that had made money in the early days and crypto. So we were the obvious place for them to come to. Um, and probably we were the first staking company to offer that the, the sort of uh, level of service that institutions expect mm -hmm. at, at the genesis block so we we picked up a lot of what i would call the the, the early adopters of of ethereum um who were in that initial block and then as as uh, it progressed um people started to get more and more confident and we saw starting to see more flows come in april may 2021 where what we were seeing was people that had been talking to us or had been generally looking at the protocol had then suddenly done enough of their own research and decided to put, put money in. These, these were still crypto native people. So the, the first group were, 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 you know, completely crypto people. These were the, you know, slightly more cautious, but they were still, they still had Ethereum. They weren't buying Ethereum, they had Ethereum and now they were making a decision to, to stake it. And, and so we saw a second wave of, of, of that type of clients and, and they were going to do more due diligence. They wanted to, they were less interested to be in the Genesis block, but they wanted to partner with a staking company and, and, and understand it in detail. And so we spent a lot of time and then we did see a wave of, of new clients. And then really this is now the third, or I'd say the third wave is since withdrawals, which happened three weeks ago, we may see a different type of client. I mean, we, we, we talk about institutions, but, um, you know, institutions were scared to get involved for a number of different reasons, one of them being they couldn't withdraw their money. You know, if you're an Ethereum enthusiast, you didn't mind, you understood that the protocol was being developed. But if you're an institution, you're probably going to be, you know, more concerned that, you know, when will you get your money out and, and, and relying on a bunch of software developers to finish it off is probably... You know, it was probably too much for institutions. Too much for yeah. to pay. I mean, yeah, the liquidity element of it was a most institutions. But I, I just like to touch on what um, Steve sort of started out with in terms of um, he sort of touched on it, but the way the test structured itself from the beginning to attract institutions uh, and ultra high net worth individuals. Um, a, we're non custodial, um, which means we don't take client assets and we don't see client assets. B, um, we don't pool client assets either, which means we fall outside of the regulatory framework. Um, because as soon as you pool something, it normally falls into the realms of financial regulation, right? So, so each client comes to us has their own set of validators. Um, they retain control of their assets as well. Uh, and then furthermore, um, we also carry a KYC on all our clients, right? Which is, if I'm honest, pretty unusual um, in the crypto space. And then on top of that, I think we structured our actual infrastructure to have, you know, a lot of resilience built into it. We, we thought about it a lot, you know, we wanted to make sure that, you know, if someone came to us, they understood we're not, you know, we're not carrying our infrastructure on 
you know, let's say one of the cloud providers. So yeah. you might recall uh, December 21, when a lot of the, 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 one of the major cloud providers in the world went down, a lot of the, the networks and crypto went down. Mm. We're very differently set up from that. We have our own data set. Well, not around. We, we use third party data centers in multiple mm. ones and in multiple locations. Uh, I just thought it was an important point to, to, to make that you know, we're very different from our competitors. Mm. And I think that to, to, to emphasize that point is, I suppose, because we work for a bank, it, you know, having one thing fail and telling our clients, well, you know, something's gone down, it's not our fault. We, we know from banking that's not an acceptable excuse. So we, 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 we built resilience right into the architecture of, of this. And, and, and to be honest, it was a little bit of a risk because when we set the company up, we, you spend a lot more money on this and you, you set it all up and then you hope somebody cares about it because you know if they don't, then they're not going to be willing to pay the premium of, of such a service. And fortunately, they did. So. <laughs> yeah, lucky for you guys, they did. So um, I'm sure that over the last few years, the staking services market has also considerably in, uh, evolved. And uh, so could you talk about that market? Who were the first movers and what role has the destined plate in the larger market? And uh, with the evolution continuing, and I'm sure that what staking services are offering would also continue to evolve. How is um, Adestin preparing to move with that evolution? I mean, it's um, it's a journey, and you know we we think we know where it's going, but you know it's, yeah. you know you know we're hoping that we, uh, we it will attract more traditional finance, and we we've, we've been prepared to do that. But as I said, answer my last last question. We 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 have seen the almost up to now has been uh, what I would regard as native crypto companies. Uh, in other words, their assets are held in Ethereum and they're looking to stake. So we don't answer questions like, you know, the, the people don't ask us questions like you were saying before about the bull market. These people are long-term Ethereum holders. So people don't compare it to the dollar. Hmm. But I think, uh, I think, you know, this, this is coming, well, coming to an end because most people who are large holders are probably staking a percentage of their of their ether mm -hmm. but new you know new incumbents coming into the coming into this um, mm -hmm. um you know the, the financial people coming into this uh, uh, sector assuming they do come they are now they'll be looking at it from um uh funds and, and various things like that they're going to be more interested in the dollar so i think the the um I think the journey is going to be different. And I think that these clients are going to expect a lot more from their staking partners, you know, rather than just providing a service. For example, they're going to expect detailed reporting and, you know, a lot more online information. And uh, the reporting side is something we, we've spent a lot of time doing. In, in mm -hmm. fact, I'll give you a stat of one of our databases. We collect every attestation made, not just made okay. by us but made by the entire chain and that is currently running at 120 million rows a day yeah. and we collect all that information and so not only can we do report on our own validators we can report on everybody else's so nice. we get to see that as performance and we think that these type of things in you know as you were probably alluding to of the type of customers coming um uh, coming to us is they're going to want this this type of information i mean funds need as much information as they can they can so you know we have sort of set ourselves up for that um we are hoping that that the traditional finance uh hmm. will, will be interested in this sector i think there's a lot of big questions around it due to regulation etc but you know a test is is setting out is setting it up to hopefully hmm see that type of client come in and, and we hopefully will provide the services that they expect and require. I mean, no, that makes only, sense. Yeah, the only thing I would add is um, we're talking about a tester, but a lot of the tools that we're actually using are mm -hmm. available. Uh, so ChainDB is one of the database tools that we've got. We also right. have Bouch, which is a client manager. We also have Dirk, which is um, mm -hmm. the, and then one tool that hasn't really been mentioned a lot is um, ETH2. Um, and whether you're aware of this or not, but ETH2 is the official tool that's used to 
the lab withdraws of the Ethereum network. I think it's because our background was initially technology, and so yeah. we just wanted to, you know, we didn't just want to be a staking company. Mm. And we wanted to be, we wanted to, um, to, to be part of the community. And one of the reasons why currently we're only by one chain, because mm. you know, we, we write a lot of the software and we deal with a lot of the community. So that's, that's hard. That's a lot of effort and takes a lot of time. So, you know, certainly the two products we mentioned, ChainDB and uh, um, ETH2, are very widely used by the community, blockchain, mm. explorers, et cetera. So, so I think that, you know, we, we built these tools because of the type of client that we thought we were going to get in the future, but we've yeah. also made them open source mm. community. So, no, that's it. Uh, talking about communities and clients, and um, you both of you have had a fair share of experience in the traditional finance and the tech space. And if you look at staking as a concept of investment, um, it's still a relative, it, I think it's still a niche, right? Yeah. So can you discuss, can you sort of discuss the broader impact that um, staking sort of has on the blockchain ecosystem and how um, it might change the way people think about asset management or decentralized finance in general? And um, also, are you already seeing uh, that sort of shift in investors or clients or communities, or do we still have some time to sort of reach there where uh, staking would be more common, so to say? Uh, probably a lot of time pick there. I mean, I, I, I'll probably start with the, the, the last yeah. thing. <laughs> is, um, we, we are definitely seeing it. Uh, we, mm. we, I mean, but we're not seeing necessarily a lot of business being driven from traditional finance, but we are spending more and more of our time. You know, I spend a lot of my time talking to these people. It's an educational piece at the moment. It's really, you know, there is regulation. There's not a lot of regulation clarity, so that does scare people. But I, I, I am definitely spending more and more time with traditional finance companies uh, mm. explaining uh, explaining this. There, I mean... You know, the, the it, it, staking is a lot more obvious if you're in crypto and you're, you're, you're holding this stuff. It becomes less obvious if you're looking at it as an asset class you invest in. So so some of these people are first wondering, should they invest in crypto? Then what should they pick? Mm -hmm. So then you've got the custody issue. And then after that, what, once you get happy with that, then the staking is the next thing. So I think that, you know, clearly at Testament, we do hope that, that we're going to see that. Uh, we are certainly having lots of conversations, but we yeah. certainly, you know, to, for for them to press the button and actually invest a, a reasonable amount, it, it's going to take time. And um, you know, we're certainly not in seeing the flows come in, but we're certainly doing a lot of the do a lot of the legwork. And I I'd imagine we probably won't see large flows for the next few years, but it will mm -hmm. be, um, you know, the, the asset managers and and, and stuff are, are mm -hmm. definitely. They're definitely doing their homework. Let's put it this way, and uh, you know there are there are many different reasons why they're not just going to jump into it. As mm. you know, as the current set of clients uh, or current set of people in crypto uh, far more um, you know far more to take on the risk. There's a lot more issues with with, with institutions, just even from client from compliance mm. yeah. to uh, regulation and various other things. Yeah, I mean, and Steve's doing to the point. I mean. Hmm. Really, if you're going to see financial asset managers come to the space, they, they want a regulated product. Right? Yeah. Uh, that's currently not really there. Uh, and what okay. we're looking for that is unregulated products. Hmm. But we would be a service provider to potentially a financial product. Right? Someone said, that I want a financial product. You know, I want I want this, and underlying it would be staking. So hmm. it would flow to us ultimately as a service provider. So it's a very different. Um, so I think regulations are part of the challenges that the staking market or staking service providers face. Um, are there any other challenges that the market currently holds or is facing? Uh, I think one of the major ones was liquidity, which was mm -hmm. resolved by the Chappelle upgrade. Um, yeah. So that was one of the major ones that perhaps prevented some family offices from entering the market. Mm -hmm. 
So they now would probably feel more comfortable knowing that actually if I put my money in, I can also get it out within a week or so. Um, the next stage is, is really is regulations and or lack thereof has been yeah. a problem, right? Um, there's some clarity coming from Europe from through MICA. Hmm. Uh, but again, that's not implemented yet. That's not till yeah. late next year when it comes in. And then even mm. then, tweaks uh, to the regulation, I imagine. Um, but like I said, you know, from our point of view, given our background, we've structured the whole business in anticipation that we are regulated. That's yeah. the way we think. So that's how we work through all, the, all our processes and, and setting up the business. Um, but I, yeah, I think the major challenge is, is regulation. Mm. And I think also, I mean, the, the, I mean, that's certainly one of the reasons why institutions, you know, they, they would necessarily put their flows or investment into it. But, you know, there's, there's, there's another point as well in, in the, the use case of using it. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. one of the things that proof of stake that I think confused quite a few people is it, it didn't improve scalability. So, so, yeah. it, so even though that, you know, so institutions of investment is one thing, um, but yeah. also to make it more useful for, or less expensive for, for you know, the, the current gas price has been ridiculous. So it's yeah. you know, over $10 just to send some ether. So it makes, you know, it, 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 it's hard for the average person to be able to use it. You know, the promise yeah. of, of, of financial inclusion is, yeah. um, it, it is, is far away when you see gas prices at that. Mm. So scalability really, proof of stake, was closing the loop from moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Now we get to scalability. Now we get to scaling. And that, and to me, this is the, where the fun part start. You know, the, this was moving us from the the old proof of work, which we want to get off. Now we can start putting the things in that that will will attract other businesses, not just from an investment point of view, but from using the ecosystem. And, and scalability is really is for the next two or three years is going to be the major focus for for yeah. Ethereum, um, you know, yeah. and we're going to see that. We're going to start to see that in the next, you know, certainly this year we will see proto dank sharding, which is the ability to be able to uh, move a lot of data around. And from a testant's point of view, will be mm. you know there's extra revenue there, um, and we will have to architect our servers, and and there'll be a you know. We'd be required to hold a lot more disk space, so you know there's there's quite a lot for us to do just just in that in that update. But but hopefully, fingers crossed, it will make uh, fees cheaper for the average Ethereum user. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. and increase adoption. Um, also, talking about, I think um, Dr. Emma did mention about how a few um, countries are coming up with clearer regulations around staking. So if we have to talk about the adoption of staking technology in different countries or geographical um, regions, do you think um, certain geographies have an upper hand over the others? And if so, which ones would they be? Um, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure in staking terms um, mm -hmm. they, they do. But certainly, yeah. if you are, I mean, fundamentally, it depends on how you structure the business. Now, if the first thing is you're pooling client assets, then the mm. answer is essentially yes, because most regulators across the globe would view that as some sort of financial product. Mm. So, and then it becomes the typical, you know, financial environment in terms of which right. environment is best for picking mm. a regulator if you fall under the regulations. But if we we look at staking the way that we've done it, you know, we're non-custodial, we don't touch client assets and therefore we don't fall under client money regulations um, and we don't uh, pool assets, then mm. in a way it, it doesn't matter. We, we set mm. up the structure. I mean, certainly the UK, you know, currently um, the, the FCA and, and uh, and many of the European regulators, they're, they're, they're concentrating, their initial, their initial focus has been on the custody of the assets yeah. and, and that jurisdiction matters more. I think mm. we will get more clarity on it because I think that, you know, it's like anything, you know, the custody was the, the probably the easiest bit for regulators to get their head around and understand, you know, staking and DeFi and all these other things. I mean, they're, they're slowly 
you know, understand how they will fit in. I mean, the UK has tended to, to stick with the equity rules and map it onto equities, which, you know, works in some parts and work, it doesn't in other bits. But, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I think at the moment with the, the, the staking is, 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 you know, is out there in a bit of limbo, really, with the... Um, uh, you know, with the regulators, but they, you know, they, they, it is it's clear to us that something will come down the pipeline on this and, and add extra clarity around, uh, you know, a, a, around services and staking companies. No, it makes sense. So, um, could you also talk about a few risks that are um, associated with staking, and or maybe risks that people perceive are associated with uh, staking or other blockchain-based services, and how? Uh, you guys are sort of addressing them at a test end. I, I suppose the, 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 um, the, I mean, there's a number of risks, but there, there's the operational risks, um, mm -hmm. you know, from uh, the risk of just, you know, your server's not running and and not not participating in it and, and losing mm -hmm. clients and clients not get rewards. So that probably the worst part of most proof of stake systems is, is getting slashed, and you know that's normally uh, where it's pretty terminal for the for the validators to get slashed. So that that risk is something that all staking companies have have got, and various people have you know gone different ways to to help mitigate that uh, that risk. Um, a test, and um, as you say, we produce open source software. So our our um, we use a distributed key manager called Dirk. And what that effectively means is, is there isn't one private key, but the private key is, 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 is composed of many shards of keys, which we spread around and we make, uh, you know, the Dirk signer will, the Dirk infrastructure will prevent, um, prevent signing from, uh, to cause slashing events. So this is something we, we built in 2019. We, we made it open source and, uh, Currently, Lido, which is the liquid provider for Ethereum, uh, last stat I looked, 25% mm -hmm. uh, was using our, our software. Uh, and so, so this is how we mitigate the risk. We, 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 we built, built our software in layers. Um, it, it's one of the difference when we first started, we realized there was that the Ethereum Foundation were building all the great software for proof of stake, but they weren't obviously concerned about the same things we were concerned from from institutional clients' point of view. And that was like the security. So we wanted to see key managers to be separate, independent layer of the software stack. And we, we went and built that, and then we made that open source. Um, so, you know, that that's, you know, from an operational point, slashing is, is, is the biggest risk. And we addressed that back in 2019. So this is, this is the thing that people are gonna ask us and institutions will care about. So, yeah. and we, and of course, in cryptography and, and um, uh, in this particular ecosystem, we we want to put it out to open source because then it gets tested by everybody else, and everybody else gets a chance to look at the code and uh, hopefully iron out any bugs before it before it hits the main net. So, so that's that's the I would say the key operational risk. Um, there's but there, of course the there are plenty of other risks that go outside of the the staking side and. Yeah comes back to regulation and probably well, mm. another risk we haven't really talked about is um, counterparty. Mm. So I mean the best way to think about counterparty is, is you've got some money as a customer and you're handing it over to someone and they take ownership of that money and you go down as a company and you mm. that money. Now the testing is like I said is very different from some of its other competitors in the state of the market. We don't take the client's money, we just offer mm. the to them to stay. So they keep their money and then the income that's generated, whether it's consensus or whether it's execution, that as well goes directly to the client when you test right? Not for, it goes from the relevant to the to the client directly. Whereas other staking providers, they will take that income themselves and then distribute it out to the customers, right? So we try to minimize our clients' counterpart risk to us to the point where if we went down we were already issued most of our clients with exit transactions. Mm -hmm. So if a company went down, they could just exit out of their value. Mm -hmm. And they haven't lost anything. So that's one risk that probably gets overlooked by a lot of investors, 
coming into the crypto market and stakers because um, they automatically assume they'll get their money back. But that's not always the case depending on how it's structured. I do think that with what we saw with FTX and a few other things, I do think that the people have become a lot more aware of this. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, th I think people and, it's, and institutions do do ask these questions. I mean, that, that's mm. the thing when we talked about the next the next uh, wave of clients. They are asking these questions because they're asking the same questions as what they would mm. ask in the traditional finance. And sometimes it's just not. <laughs> not enough solutions for them to feel comfortable <laughs> yeah and i think so, the, I, I yeah. just the, the other risk is is we've seen it in the us i mean mm. you know staking companies being closed down yeah. for various different reasons and you mm. know there we can't do a lot about apart from trying to do trying to we try to act like we regulated and and that's the best we can do and, and then we just wait and see you know Mm. regulations and hopefully we, we'll be in a position to adapt and, and fit into the, any regulations that comes down mm. so so how do you guys see the role of compliance and risk management evolving in the blockchain ecosystem and do you um, see any new challenges or are there any new challenges that you anticipate as um, this role evolves i mean it's, it's constantly changing uh, and mm -hmm. if if crypto is going to become you know the next state of finance then it will have to have compliance risk management throughout it uh, and regulation is a big part of that right? mm. you know, regulations come in it forces someone to go okay these are the these are the rules that i need to follow and i mean we've obviously done it done it on the basis that we are being looked down on top of you know and that's how we structure ourselves yeah. um but it, it is a it is something that's developing uh, in the marketplace, and I think the more regulations that, that come through, the more mm -hmm. clear you know the clearer picture everyone has, the better it will be for everyone. Uh, but it will play a big role in the future. Uh, it may not do so currently, yeah. but uh, as Steve was saying, we, we've seen what's happened in the U.S. Uh, with mm -hmm. some prominent examples of mm -hmm. assets, and you're not giving clear disclosures. You know, the regulator views it as a financial product, right? So, so it's going to play a, a big role in the future. I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, it's it's. Uh, um, I mean, you know, all you all we can do is, is is sort of prepare for. You know, we we know something is going to. Is, it, there is going to be changes in in this, and um, mm. you know, I, I think it's. You know, we we, we try to engage in in. Um, uh, at least keep our finger on the pulse of, of what's going on and uh um you know it's, it's you know I, I i would certainly like to see you know certainly the uk um mm. uh be a bit more friendlier towards towards this i think there's an opportunity yeah. for plenty of jobs and, and uh the technology and, and us to really take a, a leading role as a, in this country in, in, this, yeah. in this and uh um, I'm hoping that, that that it will continue in that direction, and uh, and the government will support these type of businesses. But but of course, you know, we we, we welcome any type of regulation that at least mm. that that means that you know sensible regulation in this industry, and you know, it will need something different from just the current 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 regulations that we've got on on our you know on the books. And I, I think it will take a bit of. Uh, you know, a bit of thought, but, you know, I think we'll eventually get there. Yeah. With that, uh, I think on that optimistic note, I'll ask my final question for today's interview. And uh, I think um, the space is always very excited about predictions, but I refrain from any uh, predictions or asking about predictions from my guests. But I will definitely ask you guys, what is that one sort of technological development or advancement that is happening or you are anticipating this year that could um, have a major impact on the sector? So anything that you guys have off right off the top of your head well i, I I'll, I'll go first because I mean I mean if we're talking about this year I mean I, I would say I've been in technology for 30 years and my ability <laughs> to make predictions have been terrible so, so <laughs> taking that as a caveat um you know yeah. mobile phones I thought would never take off but but anyway <laughs> um 
if we're only looking a year forward, so that makes it a bit easier. I, I think scalability in the blockchain mm -hmm. is, 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 is going to be something that, that, that really changes. We, we were talking about it in 2015 and there was lots of ideas, roll ups and all this type of thing. And, you know, we're now clearly seeing the, the research now really starting to, to, to roll out into this and, 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 you know, the next version of Ethereum will, will provide that. Now, of course, the question is whether it whether it makes it more usable. Because the thing is, as with most technology, we, we just end up using the capacity to what it provides. You know, broadband is always that classic example of, you know, they give you more, you do more things on it. So, you know, so I'm hoping that it will, it will bring in more people and make it more inclusive, uh, which is really what the goal of the, one of the goals of Ethereum. Ethereum was, but that that to me, I think over the next year, I, I'm I'm excited. I'm I'm hoping I won't be looking at uh, ultrasound money and looking at gas prices at, <laughs> you know, at at the height they are at the moment. It, it's good for burning ether, but it's it's not good for the average user. So that would be my 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 hope that lower gas prices would be uh, would, would be a good thing. Yeah, fully. Yeah, I, I think the the liquidity and scalability mm. at that point. You know, we're hoping that that will start to attract, you know, the institutional investor to come in. Also, are you seeing any, um, I, I know that I said that would be my last question, but <laughs> none, of you, none of you spoke about AI. I thought I'm just going to leave that probe. So anything exciting around AI or staking? Of course, blockchain tech and AI would be booming, but around uh, staking. I think it's probably because sometimes, especially with the recent withdrawals, I've had my head down so, we've been concentrating so much on that. I've not really looked up. Clearly, I see the headlines of, of AI. <laughs> but I think the thing that becomes interesting in, in some of the new technologies is it's not necessarily improving the things we know today, but it's actually, you know, it's doing things that we that we never envisaged uh, of doing. And, you know, sometimes I think it's some of them conversations I find more interesting, you know, for, you know, the, the blockchain, if it was scalable, it doesn't necessarily mean the next billion people will, on blockchain will be humans. They could be, yeah. could be devices. So, you know, I, I, I like the idea of autonomous cars uh, with AI, but with their own wallets, you know, so you, the manufacturer makes a car, pushes them out, they act as a taxi, they, they, they collect their fares, they drive you to where you want to go, and it's got a wallet, which, which people pay. <laughs> It knows when to service itself, so it drives to the garage and it pays its own bills. And then, finally, at the end of its end of its life, it, it pays to have itself um, yeah. you know, decommissioned. I mean, that's 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 the type of thing, exciting thing I think blockchain provides, and it doesn't yeah. have to be a human being on on the end. But you know, yeah, yeah. But as I say, I, I didn't predict mobile phones. So. I think that's a bit worrying. <laughs> But I, but I think I think things having wallets does does prevent does provide some interesting um, some yeah. interesting ideas and you know the the ones that that we think of now won't be the ones that will be the future. So, it, but I think that that's that that re that really gives autonomous, you know, uh, yeah. maybe scary, but but autonomous AI devices. Not only are they, you know, mm. these these. these uh, provide all this um, interest and information, but they've got the ability to buy buy and sell things <laughs> in the real world. So, uh, yeah. Good or bad, but that, that's <laughs> certainly very interesting. But I don't right. think we'll see that next year. <laughs> Let's see if this prediction of yours um, does turn out to be true or not. So <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll catch up when it does. And um, with that, I would thank both of you gentlemen for joining us today. And it was a great chat. It was lovely having both of you here. I would request all my viewers to please go ahead and follow um, go ahead and follow a testant and go ahead and follow both our lovely guests. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. Uh -huh.